Good morning, church. Wherever you are and whoever you are and wherever you're coming from on life's journey and whether you're joining us via Zoom or Facebook Live or YouTube Live, know that uh, you are welcome here in the name of Jesus Christ and the name of First Congregational United Church of Christ. Welcome to this hour of, of worship. Today we are uh, starting a new series uh, called Sowing Seeds of Sustainability and uh, have much more to say about that in, in a few moments, but how do we make um, life uh, on planet Earth more sustainable, not simply for the planet, although we will be considering that, but also for our own souls? How do we make our souls more sustainable? Um, how do we make our personal and close relationships more sustainable? How do we make our community, the community in which we live more sustainable? Those kind of things. So um, at the end of worship today, um, we will be offering communion as always. And so if you have uh, juice and crackers or bread and wine available uh, or any other elements that symbolize communion for you, know that you are most welcome to uh, join us, whether you're a member of the church or, or not. Um, so let's uh, simply um, take a deep breath in and I'm gonna ring a bowl and then, uh, uh, and then um, Grant will uh, be offering some music in which we can spend the next few minutes preparing ourselves uh, to, or stepping more deeply into worship by um, considering in the last 24 hours of our lives and what blessings have come your way just in the last 24 hours. Let us draw our focus on uh, giving thanks. Most holy God, in the words of Duke Ellington, who 
whose hymn we just heard have been hearing from Grant. Lord, dear Lord, we've loved God Almighty, God of love. Please look down and see your people through. Lord, dear Lord, we've loved God Almighty, God of love. Please look down and see our people through. We believe that sun and moon up in the sky, when day is gray, we know it, clouds passing by. You'll give peace and comfort to every troubled mind. Come Sunday, oh, come Sunday. That's the day. Amen. Very aptly uh, chosen hymn, the, the Canticle of Zechariah. We'll be hearing a lot more about uh, Zechariah in a moment. But first, uh, let us um, hear from Rabbi uh, Brian Mayer, who's offering our multi-generational reflection. I believe this is one last time in this set of reflections for us. Uh, let's turn to Rabbi Brian. Hi, I'm Rabbi Brian. Hi, friends at First Congregational UCC. Oh, hi, Dr. Eric. Principles of spiritual religious discernment. That's a lot of big words. Principles of spiritual religious discernment. What does that even mean? These are some ideas, principles, for our spiritual religious lives to help us discern, to figure out what it is that God, howsoever we understand that word, what it is that God might want from us. And I hope you enjoy as I explain each one of these six spiritual religious discernment tools. If we are so filled with knowing what it is things should be, 
were like a cup of water that's filled to the brim and no more could go in. If we're so certain of what's right and what's wrong, maybe we're not giving the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, an ability to tell us what is right and what's wrong. Chuang Tzu wrote, unawareness of one's belt is a sign of pants that fit. Well, that makes sense. If you're not paying any attention to your waist, your pants must fit. Unawareness of one's feet is a sign of shoes that fit. You don't notice your your feet and your shoes unless something's wrong. Unawareness of one's belt is a sign of pants that fit. Unawareness of one's feet is a sign of shoes that fit. Unawareness of right and wrong is a sign of a mind at ease. This might be a little bit hard for the younger kids, but for the older ones, I think you can understand. If your mind is at ease, you don't see this is exactly or da, 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 da. and you have a little bit more equanimity fancy word for peace and the more peace that we have that's the goal to go through life with less certainty and more openness It's time for our ancient testimony. And the ancient testimony for today is from Luke 1, beginning at verse 5 and finishing up at verse 64. I'm going to be reading from the message this morning. During the rule of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest assigned service in the regiment of Abijah. His name was Zechariah. His wife was descended from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Together they lived honorably before God, careful in keeping to the ways of the commandments, and enjoying a clear conscience before God. But, there's always a but, right? <laughs> but they were childless because Elizabeth could never conceive. And now they were quite old. It so happened that Zach, as Zachariah was carrying out his uh, priestly duties before God, working the shift assigned to his regiment, it came his one turn in life. Only one, his one turn in his whole life to enter the sanctuary of God and burn incense. The congregation was gathered and praying outside the temple at the hour of the incense offering. Unannounced, an angel of God appeared just to the right of the altar of incense. Zachariah was paralyzed with fear. But the angel assured him, don't fear, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Elizabeth, your wife, will bear a son by you. You are to name him John. You're going to leap like a gazelle for joy. And not only you. Many will delight in his birth. He'll achieve a great stature with God. He will turn many sons and daughters of Israel back to their God. He will herod God's arrival and the style and strength of Elijah. Soften the hearts of parents to children and kindle devout understanding among hardened skeptics. He'll get the people ready for God. Zechariah said to the angel, Do you expect me to believe this? I'm an old man and my wife, my wife is an old woman. But the angel said, 
I am Gabriel, the sentinel of God, sent especially to bring you this very glad news. But because you won't believe me, you will be unable to say a word until the day of your son's birth. Every word I've spoken to you will come true in time, God's time. Meanwhile, the congregation waiting for Zachariah was getting very restless, wondering what was keeping him so long in the sanctuary. When he came out and couldn't speak, they knew he had seen a vision. He continued speechless and had to use sign language with the people. When the course of his priestly assignment was finally completed, he went back home. When Elizabeth was full term in her pregnancy, she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives, seeing that God had overwhelmed her with mercy, celebrated with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and were calling him Zachariah after his father. But his mother intervened. No, he is to be called John. But they said, no one in your family is named that. They used sign language to ask Zachariah what he wanted him named. Asking for a tablet, Zachariah wrote, his name is to be John. That took everyone by surprise. And then surprise followed upon surprise. Zachariah's mouth was now open, his tongue loose, and he was talking and, and praising God for this miracle of a son. Oh, man. Thank you, Bunny. Interesting story, isn't it? This is from the first chapter of the book of Luke. And incidentally, um, we will be um, going through the book of Luke, the whole gospel, eventually. In fact, um, with a, just a couple of exceptions in January, um, we'll be actually in the gospel of Luke clear until Pentecost this year, so in May. Uh, we'll be dabbling uh, with different, uh, and at, at, at the, after the first of the year, we'll be going through chapter by chapter. But right now, we're going to be going through some of the uh, the Christmas uh, story, because Christmas is coming a little early to us this year, uh, starting with uh, Luke 1, and uh, the, in the story of Jack, Jeremiah, uh, Jack, Zechariah and Elizabeth. But before we move further into that, that story, um, has anybody ever read, uh, seen uh, this, this book here, the, um, the Book of Joy? That's a, a, yeah, good, good. A couple of you, have, looks like you've, you've read it. Uh, yeah, that's a book that was, that was created um, out of a conversation between Archbishop Tutu and the Dalai Lama uh, that was held in uh, Darsala, India, where the Dalai Lama has been in exile um, on the occasion of the Dalai Lama's 80th birthday. And they brought together these two just spiritual giants for um, a conversation about how do we... Um, experience or, or uh, how do we become joyful or happy um, and actually the, the premise was happy but Archbishop Tutu um, uh, challenged that uh, saying you know happiness is actually just um, you know a lot of how we become happy is based on external circumstances but they both agreed that there is something there's a form of happiness that is not dependent upon external circumstances you know, hardly at all if at all um, and that is um, that comes through joy, the quality of joy. So the, the conversation in that book really revolved around how do we find um, uh, avenues for experiencing joy uh, consistently in life and producing then happiness in and out of season. Um, it's a fascinating book, read if you haven't read it. Um, and we're gonna be exploring that um, during this series of Sowing Seeds of Sustainability. Um, how many of you received uh, a packet um, in the mail yet uh, that has something like this in it from, from the church? Not all of you would have. Uh, they, they, got, uh, they got mailed out on uh, a Friday and some of them, some of them we, we had a printer breakdown, so um, some won't be mailed till, till Monday. So if you don't have this in your mailbox, um, if you're with the church, um, you, you will uh, very soon uh, next week. But inside 
the, uh, the envelope is a letter to you uh, from a different member of the congregation, uh, from five different members, um, one, um, who were each assigned a group of 30 of you. And then there's this, there's this um, packet. I'm going to, to show you uh, what you can expect to see. I'm going to change my camera here just a second here to my fancy, uh, my fancy screen cam. There, there, there we go. Okay. So this is the, this is the packet uh, you've received or will receive. And uh, there's a night that Lane Young from our congregation designed for us. And uh, there's a little, nice little clip on it. And then you can open it up. And it's got several things in here that will help you engage more deeply with this series. One is simply a card that shows uh, what days we'll have um, you know, the, worship, the various worship themes um, and some instructions on it. There are a couple of covenant cards in here. Um, they're meant in case there's two people in the household. Um, if there's more, then you'll just have to make up your own covenant card for the third or fourth person. But um, these um, explain what a covenant is, which we're going to be inviting you to make uh, four different um, covenants that are personal covenants between you and the Holy Spirit in November of 22. I mean, I mean in 20, for 2022. Now on the back, uh, a little place to keep track of the different covenants you've made with respect to sustain creating greater sustainability in your soul, in your close relationships, in your faith community, and in God's world. And then, kind of a fun bonus, um, besides the nice bookmark that Lane created for us, um, are these little pieces of paper that, that each represent one of these covenants we're making, and you can take them off, and they are, they're seed paper. So this one represents the covenant you'll make with respect to how do you bring more joy into your soul in 2022. And you can plant this in the ground, actually, and there's instructions for doing this, but you can actually, um, there are flower seeds in this paper, so you can actually, just as we seek to, to receive a harvest from the covenants we make in 2022, um, you can actually see, hopefully, a harvest um, taking place right, right there. So anyway, I'm going to switch back. Here. So that's what you can expect to receive this this coming week, and um, I hope you have you have you have fun fun with them. And uh, we're going to be considering this morning how we find uh, joy um, for our soul. So this will be a little primer, so help help kind of get your own uh, juices flowing for what what could you either bring into your life in 2022, or what can you cut out from your life in 2022 that will help bring you more a regular sense of joy and therefore happiness that transcends um, external circumstances. And you may want to think about what you can both add and cut out too. Usually if you're going to add something, you need to cut something out. So find what you can cut out too, as well as add. And uh, this morning I wanted to go into this unusual story in Luke's gospel as a way of giving us a hint at at least one possible covenant you might want to make or consider anyway. Um, and this is, has to do with the, the story of Zechariah. We'll be covering Elizabeth next week, by the way, but we're going to focus on Zechariah, this, this priest um, who um, would have been, uh, who was a priest in the, in the temple um, in Jerusalem at, uh, just before, uh, well, in the time of Jesus. This is a, a model of that temple in Jerusalem. And um, it's important to, to know, understand what's going on in the story. It's important to know um, a little bit about um, how this temple is designed. There's that outer court, courtyard kind of to the front left, but then there's this inner courtyard. And then within the inner courtyard and in back of it, there is this tall structure, which is the inner sanctuary. And within the inner sanctuary, there's also an inner um, area this is a quite a speculative mock of of, of that inside sanctuary, that inner sanctuary. But you see that big red curtain behind, uh, you know, at the back of things. Um, behind that curtain would have been the holy of holies. And does anybody uh, remember what what special object is in the holy of holies, or was said to be there? Uh, anybody, go ahead and unmute yourself. If you if you remember, if you're a biblical scholar here, oh. the ark, ark of, of the, the covenant. covenant? Yes, excellent. We've got some biblical scholars in our midst. We ha had the Ark of the Covenant, uh, of course, which was also the feature uh, featured prominently in that Indiana Jones film back in what 1980 or one. Um, 
but not actually the Ark of the Covenant wouldn't have looked precisely like the Indiana Jones version. You see those those winged creatures on the top there. Um, those are known as seraphim, and they would have been actually much larger. Um, they would actually have had their wings out like that, um, like like God was actually sitting on top of the wings. And so that box, which contained the covenant documents from you know the, like the Ten Commandments. Um, uh, that that was uh, the footstool. So this was supposed to be like a throne for God. The covenant box was the footstool, and God was enthroned above it invisibly, um, uh, uh, sitting on the on the wings of the of the seraphim. Now it's not important whether you believe this was actually true or not. What's important to know is that Israel counted this as true. That this is the the, the holiest place on earth. It's really where God's uh, present is presence is most. Um, in cr- most concentrated in one place, uh, and so um, and if you're going to go into God's presence, you, um, you're you know, it, it's not necessarily um, this nice warm fuzzy experience necessarily because if you're going to be part you know, if you're immortal and you're standing next to per- utter perfection, um, it could be they considered to be quite dangerous actually, um, and so you didn't just do that just wander behind the curtain to meet with God. In fact. Um, like uh, uh, you heard earlier, that would, this probably would have been a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for any priest to go behind that curtain, and there was incense that needed to be replaced on the altar regularly, and uh, what they call showbread uh, on the altar. And so you were you were chosen by lot, and and priests regularly were chosen, but then they'd have to go through all kinds of cleansing. Uh, rituals to make sure that they were um, they were as pure as possible, so they could stand in that presence. And then they literally tied a rope to your right uh, to your right ankle if you went in, just in case you became incapacitated back there. And and they, of course they didn't want to go into that dangerous place, so they they could pull you out by that rope. Um, and and this is this is stuff that really happened. And so um, you can imagine Zechariah. Um, who's chosen by lot to to perform this service in the Holy of Holies, it would have been a very um, exciting thing, but also a very scary thing <laughs> at the same time. Um, you know, you could die back there if you were, you know, if you were, were weren't properly pure in the in the presence of this purity. And um, but likely also, this is an opportunity for somebody um, a once in a lifetime opportunity, um, in their perception anyway to ask for something. Like, what would you do if you knew, if you absolutely knew for a fact that, um, that God was absolutely present, it's like you actually had the ear of the creator of the universe for a few moments, that God's undivided attention was on you, would there be anything you might ask in that time? Your, once, your one time in a life, to re, when you really know you have God's ear, is there something perhaps that might bring you more consistent joy, for instance, in your life. You know, what would you ask for if you had God's ear? Um, I'm going to invite us actually to pause um, and hear our anthem before moving forward. Um, but I want to invite you to, to, to really think about that. If you had the chance to, and you knew that you had God's ear, and that you knew you're in the greatest potential to have some request Um, that brings you and your soul consistent joy, Um, what would that one thing be? Amen. Let's go down.
And now time for the modern testimony, which this week comes from the internationally known poet and author, David White. This is entitled A Deep and Dazzling Darkness, and it's from his Winter Harvest newsletter. We are a living conversation between what we thought was the past and what we could only imagine as the future. We are creatures made to hold past, present, and future together. But in every human life, there are those thresholds and those hours that seem to carry within them a very specific invitation, sometimes even a beckoning portent, and many times even the actual pattern of what is about to occur. A time when events seem soul-sized and where the individual intuits that everything that is done has enormous significance, that somehow a future life is being delineated and determined by what is said and acted upon on a daily or even hourly basis. It is as if this personal interior unraveling has been a necessary inner correspondence to an equally powerful outer raveling, a making of meaning through creating an almost overpowering sense of absence at the center, an invitational mystery through which something central to the pattern can be invited in to reorder everything, everything that had previously been so well arranged in the outer world. Uncovering the truth has always involved a living relationship with the great interior and exterior unknown. It is not the act of revealing a new fact, but the joining of a conversation that previously we could not understand or did not think was possible, or more commonly, did not think we deserved. Mm. Powerful words. Thanks, Bunny. So back to our, um, our book momentarily here. Um, here we have these, these uh, two spiritual giants, arguably some of the, the greatest spiritual masters alive today in the, in the world, asked about how do we bring joy to our, our existence. And uh, they agreed on three primary routes that must kind of be there in order for, to experience joy on a, uh, on, on a regular basis and, and re regardless of external circumstances. Incidentally, do you know that, that actually there's, there are studies that have been done um, back in the late 70s. There was a study that showed that um, uh, people who win the lottery are not appreciably more happy than those who have, are, are paralyzed and bedridden. It, it's amazing, isn't it? They, they, and the, the study was, suggested that we each have kind of this set point within us that we kind of return to some set kind of joy level that we kind of re return to. But subsequent research kind of questioned that, that we have this kind of fixed set joy level that we, that we can't really come above or below uh, too much. And, and increasing science suggests we can actually, we can increase uh, the amount of uh, joy uh, we experience, uh, even in really, really difficult um, circumstances. And there are really three uh, three primary avenues that needed to kind of be open for this to happen. One was the ability to reframe your circumstances. So can you, you know, you, we each have a, an idea of like what our present circumstances look like and we have an evaluation of that. But oftentimes we, we you know, we think that what we're seeing is just the, here's the one interpretation of what's going on in our lives. But is that the only interpretation of what's going on with you presently that's possible? And is the framing right? Um, can you adjust the frame? Like you say, okay, well, I've just been fired from my job. This means I, I must mean I'm a lazy, you know, no good, you know, person. I'm not worth anything. Well, is that true, first of all? But even if that were true, which likely it's not, can you at least reframe um, where you're looking in this circumstance? You know, maybe 
the frame is I've just been given an opportunity to find a, a new position that might make me less lazy and, <laughs> and make me more invested in, in what I'm doing, you know, things like that. Can, uh, we're in a global pandemic. Um, boy, life is really tough. Life really, you know, is really, really hard and, 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 and dark right now. Well, can we reframe that? We've just, you know, can we, you know, for instance, acknowledge that we've all been given an opportunity to, to see just how much our joy is dependent upon external circumstances. When a lot of those sources of joy have been cut off, you know, from us, can we still experience joy? Um, it's really a pandemic becomes a good test of, you know, where are we in our joy level? And can we uh, consistently find joy even when a lot of things that made us happy um, are, are not available to us? So that's the first thing uh, is, is experiencing a, um, uh, you know, a, an ability to reframe circumstances that will point in the direction of joy. Uh, the second one is uh, gratitude. That, uh, that gratitude uh, for everything around you, seeing your life as a moment by moment um, uh, un unraveling of and unveiling of gifts um, is just absolutely essential um, for producing a regular experience of joy that is not dependent upon external uh, circumstances. So, uh, and we'll have a little more to say about that um, a little later. And then also then the third piece, so you have the, the reframing and then second is the is is constantly being aware of what you have to be grateful for. And the third thing uh, really builds off those two, and that is uh, generosity or kindness. Not just simply accepting all these wonderful things for ourselves, but actually let it move through us and actually responding to it in some way in acts of generosity and kindness towards other people. If you have those three things in place and in place in your life consistently. Um, even the science is saying um, this is a way to 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 bring that joy, uh, you know, set point, raise it higher on a consistent basis in your life. And sure enough, I think this is what's happening. Um, I, I want to reframe this story a little bit um, that you just heard from Zechariah and see if we can make some sense out of it. You know, this it seems um, really kind of unfair, doesn't it, that Zechariah comes in to the to this this holy place, and you know he's got he's thinking about what he might ask God for. This is once in a lifetime opportunity, and we know from based on what the angel says, you know, that, that Elizabeth is going to have a child. That a likely uh, that she's been barren, um, and and so it's likely that um, Zechariah. You know, is at least thinking, boy, I wish we, you know, we could have a child. Um, and but he's probably not going to ask that because he and she are old. It's impossible, he thinks, to have a child. But but you know, the presence of a child can certainly bring joy in one's life, and especially if one's been wanting a child and cannot have a child. And in their day, they had most people had an extra incentive to want children, um, not simply for joy purposes, but children were, um, you know, in a day without Social Security. Um, children were your your social security plan, and so if you did not have children, once you became unable to work, if if there were no children involved, then the community would need to step forward and help you out. And so, oftentimes, people without children were seen by the community to be um, um, either uh, cursed by God because they couldn't have children, um, and and in their day there was an idea that if you couldn't, that was that may be a moral problem for you that God is punishing you for. Uh, another piece might be that well maybe you do have the ability but you just chosen not to and so you are lazy and you are you are uh, uh, you are eventually going to be a burden on your community so uh, there was this extra kind of um, you know this feeling of shame if you didn't have a child that existed back then that may not exist now thank goodness but it did it back then and so you can imagine again Zechariah walking into you know he's got God's ear and you know at least thinking boy I wish we had a child um, but maybe not saying that but then the angel says guess what you know he the angel knows what's on his mind um, Elizabeth will bear a child um, this this coming year um, but then it doesn't seem unfair I mean do you think wow that's pretty neat but you know that is it's pretty unbelievable I mean she's way beyond uh, childbearing age so is he um, and she's always been barren um, it seems pretty. It seems like any logical person would say, "What?" <laughs> I mean, yes, I know you represent God, and there's this angel standing behind me, in front of me. This is a pretty impressive thing, um, but but really, seriously, or is God just trying to pull my leg? 
Incidentally, just as a reminder, these stories um, they themselves seem fantastical, and I'm not going to claim that this story is being related exactly historically, exactly what happened this way. A lot of stories in the Bible did happen historically. There's other stories that are really meant to lift up that mythological imagination that we talk about, where it's not meant to tell us exactly what happened two or 3,000 years ago, over and done, but rather things that happen over and over and over again, uh, on up to the present life. So these stories are meant to, to teach us principles of life that, that transcend the historical moment. So the story, at bare minimum, even if it's not historically uh, accurate, um, uh, it is very much spiritually accurate, trying to point us to things that take place in the soul that can lead to joy, I think. Um, and But right now we've got this, this trouble. It's like sometimes we are presented with opportunities that the Spirit puts in front of us and they seem too good to be true. Have you ever had that experience? Like you have, an, you have an intuition that something is going to go well in your life. But then you feel like, well, wait a minute, that's just wishful thinking. You know, that's just me. But you, but you have this intuition. It's a, it's a stronger than normal feeling like it's coming not just from you, but from something else. And, or you just feel like you don't deserve it. Um, there's no way that God could want to bless me this way. I'm being egotistical. I'm being unrealistic. I'm being, you know, whatever it is. You know, it's a very natural tendency for any of us when we have an intuition that moving in a certain direction will produce good results and we feel like we've been guided that way to feel like, ooh, this is too, too high a calling for me. This is too great a wondrous thing or, it's, it, or this is just simply impossible. So he names that impossibility. Zechariah names that, that impossibility. And what does the angel turn around and do? Do you remember that? Anybody want to unmute themselves? and tell, tell, What does the angel do? How does the angel respond? Mutes Zachariah. What's that? Mutes Zachariah. Yeah, he says, and he says, yeah, because you did not believe me, <laughs> you will not speak until the day of your, your child's birth. And we know from later on the story where they're having to actually write down a question to John, he also must have gone um, not only uh, mute, but also deaf. So, <laughs> like, what the heck? You know, just for bringing up something that any normal, rational person would, would, would probably say or at least feel feel like, are you serious? This doesn't seem true. He's being punished? Well, that's oftentimes the way we interpret things, don't we? When, when, thing, that when spirit brings us things, things our way that we don't necessarily um, think are, are good, um, we think we're being punished. Isn't that just a normal thing? Like, oh, maybe we don't even think spirits brought them. We just, life happens to us and God didn't intervene. Um, and therefore we think, well, what have I done to deserve this? Well, interestingly enough, um, that is a very common emotion. Um, and we've, read, we've just read into the story that the angel is punishing Zechariah for failure to believe. But nowhere in the text did Bunny ever say, and the angel said, now I'm going to punish you. The angel just simply said, because you didn't believe me, you're going to be uh, you know, deaf and mute, essentially. Um, and we have interpreted that as punishment. But I wonder if we were actually to you know, think about Zechariah. Is this really a punishment? Or can we reframe and see the story and see something a little bit different happening? Does anybody happen to know, um, who is not on a worship team where we discuss this, what the name John means, this child that is predicted to be born? Anybody know what, what, the, what the etymology of John, what, what does that mean? Beloved. Huh? Beloved. Loving? Uh-huh. Well, it does have something to do with love. Yes. Beloved. The, the, the beloved. Oh, yes. Well, John, uh, there is a disciple named John that was called the beloved disciple. But the, the actual meaning of the Hebrew word uh, John uh, means God is gracious. Hmm. God is gracious. So put yourself in Zechariah's sandals just for a moment here. Let's just imagine that you've had this encounter and this promise. And the very last thing you hear before you go deaf and mute for nine long months is God is gracious. God is gracious. And so as you step out into the world, for nine months you can't open your mouth and talk. And maybe you're not even hearing a lot. 
you're just looking. And that phrase is going over and over and over in your head. God is gracious. Not punishing. Not God has anger management issues. Not God is far away and doesn't care about me. God is gracious. How might that cause you to reframe your world and the things you encounter? And not just the the beautiful things, little children and birds, and but also some of the harder things in life. The things we don't necessarily accept as gifts. But to simply be quiet, though, and not interrupt the stream of your experience and keep those words just keep coming again and again. God is gracious. God is gracious. Some things easy to affirm and some things you really make you stretch. How is God gracious when I'm seeing X, Y, or Z? Can I still affirm that God is gracious if this or this or this is happening in the world? I'm guessing after nine months, you could pretty much find a route to the graciousness of God no matter what is in front of you. That it becomes a moment-by-moment reality that you realize that Every single moment in life, no matter what it brings, is an opportunity for blessing. An opportunity to find that joy that is absolutely independent of external circumstance. Mm -hmm. But there for you as pure, unadulterated gift, every waking moment, God is gracious That's what I think was going on for nine months. An incredible blessing. <laughs> for once, a priest doesn't have to talk, <laughs> doesn't have to preach, could just simply absorb the world, take it in, and be constantly reminded God is gracious. God is gracious. So the time comes, and Elizabeth says his name will be John, and the crowd reacts, No, no, that's not in the family line. There's nobody named John in your family line. Zechariah! You know, they write on a tablet, what shall this child's name be? And he writes on that tablet, his name is John. And suddenly his voice, he can hear again, he can speak again. And, he, and if you go on and read on your, on your own the rest of uh, Luke chapter 1, you'll find that he just bursts out in this ecstatic uh, hymn uh, that you heard the choir sing, actually. Now, having had nine, uh, uh, the blessing of the child and nine months reminder that every moment, even a childless one, is a moment to be blessed and uh, affirm that God is gracious. And of course, we know that John and Elizabeth, you know, we know the rest of the story, that they gave birth to John the Baptist. And maybe he had, you know, the, the, the Spirit was blessing him in ways also preparing him uh, to, to keep that frame because you know, the Spirit knew better than John at that point, uh, or better than Zechariah or Elizabeth, what the, this child's future may hold. We know that this child would be the one to baptize Jesus and likely actually uh, was a teacher of Jesus um, before, because um, it was John's disciples who were baptized. And so likely Jesus sat at John's feet, John's feet, their child, that the Messiah would sit at their child's feet and learn from him and be influenced by him. Wow! I mean, talk about God is gracious. Imagine if one of your children, you know, were, were set aside to be a teacher of Jesus, you know, right? Um, but also, there's a reminder that, you know, this child um, did not um, live to a ripe old age, but rather um, he got, uh, was constantly um, bucking up against the system and the authorities. And King Herod did not like that much and eventually ser- literally served John's head on a platter. Uh, and so you know, there's this really fierce, I think, um, attentiveness to uh, where we find grace in this world and, and the insistence that that in all things we can find uh, grace, even when 
uh, the world does not seem to be serving us uh, grace, that um, to be reminded that even um, when life does not go the direction that we choose, um, and even if life were to end, that still moment by moment we can affirm um, there is grace here, there is love here. The world may not be serving us to a, it to us, but the world's creator uh, very much is. This, of course, is a, um, an understanding that Jesus himself would bring forward into our, um, our consciousness. Uh, and very much prominently in the ritual that we celebrate every week, known as communion, in which Jesus you know, took bread and broke the bread at a Passover Seder before he was killed, saying, my friends, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. And so likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we remember Christ's death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection. And we know that if this what happened to Jesus on the cross and at the empty tomb reveals the heart of the heart of God, then we know that within God's own experience, God knows what life is like when a parent has lost an only child. That's, that's, the revel, that's part of the revelation. That's one of the reasons why, even though it's metaphorical, it still matters to say Jesus as God's son and God as a father or a mother because it reveals that deep in God's own experience, God knows what it's like to be a parent who loses an only child who is brutally murdered. And yet we also know that God is capable at the, through the empty tomb of transforming even our deepest hurts into the heights of joy. And God is able to create any story who, that we think is an ending and reframe that story as a new beginning. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us join the feast. And let us pray. Holy God, like David White says, we live at the intersection of what we perceive to be the past and what we can only speculate will be the future. And at that intersection, we call this intersection this moment. Spirit of the living God, help us to moment by moment find avenues for thanksgiving. To name the blessings that we see around us, even when life heads in directions that we would not necessarily choose ourselves. And God, we realize that we are not the only ones who are challenged to reframe the narrative that we put upon ourselves and to find blessing. But there are many who suffer, in, at least in our perception, far more than we suffer. That sometimes our privilege allows us to step aside from certain suffering. So God, we ask that as you make us increasingly aware of our own blessings, as we work, in fact, and we join you in helping us call to mind our own blessings, Help create within us soft spots within our hearts. Soft spots that open to others. That we may become part of your blessing the world. That we may claim whatever privileges that we've been given and turn them over for benefit to make them work for blessing. So that perhaps 
one day, hopefully many days, people will say, thank you, God, for this blessing, and that blessing will have traveled through our hands. In spirit, we also recognize that there are people in our midst and in our lives who are uh, wrestling particularly in our congregation with uh, physical ailments or mental or spiritual ones, including uh, uh, Alex Lasky, we hold him up, and Sarah and, uh, and Jessica Vasquez, uh, Jackie Vasquez. And we invite others to mute themselves at this time. Name those names that we can all center around in prayer. Juliet Prosser. Larry Marmot. Marbot, excuse me. My sister Joanne. For those named and those uh, named uh, out loud and also in our hearts, God, we offer our prayers as we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Mm. Well, every week when we remind ourselves of the grace that we have been given, we also do um, intentionally work at giving away, being part of that generous flow from gift to, gift to gifting. And there are many ways to do that. We uh, think about the box, the basket, and the list in particular. And the, the box is, uh, well, a virtual box right now. This is where you can go on the website. And uh, if you just uh, go to our website, you can click the donate button and, and uh, respond to God's gift of, of abundance financially um, if you, and share them with uh, your faith community that help ensure the present and future ministries of First uh, Congregational United Church of Christ. Uh, but we also have uh, the basket, and the basket is those, um, those items that are, happen to be in our lives that maybe other people can use more than we can that we want to give away. And right now, Barbara Bennett is, con is continuing to collect items for um, the houseless and homeless in our community, our, our houseless and homeless neighbors. You can bring them into Fellowship Hall, and if you'll leave your name with those items, uh, she'll send you a gift receipt, too, if you'll, if you'll send your, leave your address or email address. Also, uh, Eve Circle uh, uh, is continuing with that basket by uh, uh, starting up their yearly undies under the tree uh, drive. And so if you have a, a brand new clean um, undergarments, um, they also will be uh, uh, donated to uh, Rosehaven, um, who, which helps um, houseless and homeless uh, women in particular. And so you can bring them in starting uh, today, actually, and throughout the season and donate undies. There, if you get it on our, our newsletter, there are several ways to give. You can either give physical items or you can also give financially, and there are instructions for that. And then finally, uh, Bonnie has a few ideas about how we can give our time and talent um, away uh, in response to God's love and grace. Eric, I think this is my cue, correct? Yes, this is your cue. Okay, you said Bonnie, but it's not Bonnie, my dear. It's Bonnie. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say, I said Bonnie? <laughs> oh my goodness, sorry. <laughs> no problem. No problem. It's a very common thing. Um, okay, so uh, I have a handful of announcements from Eric. Um, uh, from our wonderful curator of the ArtReach Gallery, Sheldon Hurst, he reports that uh, new, two new exhibitions are up through the end of December. Triad is in our chapel gallery and it includes the art by three young women of Kolkata, India. They recently received a master's of fine art degree and this is the first work they have um, done since graduation. Secondly, through the looking glass is the art of uh, Carola Penn, 
in which she focused on second childhood. This whimsical art invites each of us to reconsider the various influences on our personal identity formation. For her, it included the com comic strip character, Little Lulu. Some of us remember that, among other inspirations. The Art uh, Reach Gallery is open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 o'clock to 2 p.m. or by special appointment, if you will contact uh, Sheldon Hurst directly. A thank you, he says, goes to um, the I Am My Story, Jim Lamason and Sankar Raman for joining with Ai Weiwei and the artists in our last exhibition, which if you didn't ca uh, catch, you really missed something very, very special. Thank you for that, Sheldon. Okay, next, our next book club selection for November is The Hidden Life of Trees. And the sharing begins November 9th at 4.30 p.m. Check the website or call the office for the Zoom connection. Um, this is a very important one, folks. So heads up, please. Remember to fill out the post-pandemic church survey. Uh, it can be found in a recent email sent out this last week or in our newsletter, which you received at the end of the week. If you somehow miss all of that, call the office. They'll get you connected. And now next week, a week from today, November 14th, is our second Sunday worship celebration with the option to attend and worship. And uh, a couple of important things to note for that coming worship service, Bienvenidos Quilts will be on display that weekend. So you won't want to miss that wonderful display, uh, these wonderful women um, making quilts for children at the border. And then secondly, on that same Sunday, November 14th, we will be observing All Souls Day together. And if you have a friend or a loved one who passed into their eternity during our worldwide uh, COVID pandemic, and you would like to honor that person in our November 14th worship service together, please email their phone, uh, their years of life, and a photo, if possible, to the church. And we can include them in this very sacred time of remembrance. That's all. Now, my friends, may the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the living God, made known to us as Christians most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to push you into those places you may not necessarily go yourself, go beneath you to uphold you and uplift you, go beside you to be your strong and constant companion and dwell within you to remind you that you are surely not alone on this journey, and you are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination, because God truly is gracious. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you, and within you, and through you, now and always. Amen. <laughs>